This is Duke University. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's commemoration of the life and work of Asya Jabbar, um, who, as most of you I'm sure know, um, died in February of this year. So, born Fatma Zahra Imalayan in 1936 in Churchill, um, Asya Jabbar, she changed her name in 1957. But I think it's important to start with her real name, her birth name, because I think it sheds light on the struggles that she had, the struggles after um, independence, struggles that many of the North Africans and many of the colonized Arab peoples had after the British and the French left, and that was when you no longer are um, being forced to use the language of the colonizer, what resource do you have? And of course, for the middle class from which she came, um, the language that they had was French. So the, the call had been for authenticity, a sala. And the notion was before independence in all of these countries that asala would mean that you would become, you would return to being Arab and Muslim. So then the issue that I think she was one of the first to raise, but that became then very much an issue, was well, uh, actually, I'm not Arab. I'm North African, but I'm Berber. And yes, she was Muslim, but. She was also educated in a school that was primarily a, a Christian school where she, in fact, was the only Muslim. She was also educated um, earlier in a Quranic school, what is called a Qutab, uh, where she was one of two girls. So always slightly um, unusual, exceptional. So today we're going to hear about her struggles, her struggles with language, struggles that ended up being uh, victories rather than, than struggles. And we will, I think, hear in, um, in most of the papers, but certainly in, in two specifically, about the way in which she enriched French with both Berber and Arabic. And of course, her extraordinary literary output, 17 novels in French, earned her um, an, the election or the, the appointment to the Académie Française. So there again, she was exceptional. She was the first North African writer to be invited into the Académie Française. So of course, there are lots of debates about her. Was she a feminist? And of course, for some, she, she wasn't. And I think this is particularly uh, from an Arab context, the term feminist is very, is very problematic. Uh, feminism as a Western concept, radically misused by the colonial powers, the, the French and the British, as Gayatri Spivak so famously taught us. But, Nonetheless, I think for those of us who are trying to think about um, the ways in which a writer is articulating a particular kind of political project, for me, she is certainly, she's certainly a feminist. And I think she's one of the first in Arab literature, and when I say Arab, I, I mean Arab because I don't mean Arabic, Arabic just being uh, the literature that's written in the language Arabic. She's one of the first Arab writers to really take on the uh, subaltern studies project. So in the novel that we're going to hear about uh, today in a couple of the papers, actually I think in three, so uh, L'amour, la fantasia, uh, love, fantasia in English translated, um, I think, Algerian cavalcade. Um, she is mining 
a number of sources. So she is, she was a historiographer, she was a historian, she was a novelist, she was a filmmaker, and in everything that she did and wrote, she was looking for the women who had been erased from official histories. So she was looking between the lines of men's histories, French men's histories, um, the post-independence Algerian um, FLN leaders' histories, looking for those women who she knew because she had experienced the War of Independence between 54 and 62. She knew that women had been there and she knew that they had been erased. And so she knew how to go into the Algerian countryside as she did in her films, in her two films in the 70s, to try and find those voices. And almost in a kind of Saidian contrapuntal way, she puts those voices into conversation with the voices of the women she imagines would have had the same experience of participation in resistance and erasure during the 19th century. So she puts the women in the Maquis, the heroines of the resistance, of the 54-62 resistance, into conversation with the 19th century feminists, feminist warriors who were erased, and puts all of this into what she called her autobiographical quartet. The autobiographical quartet, and um, I'm not sure if the fourth came out, did it? Because we have uh, Shahrazad and um, Fantasia, so vast a prison, and then I guess the fourth could be any of uh, ten, 10 novels that she wrote. Ah, uh, yes, um, a woman without a sepulcher. <laughs> yes, which was 2002. And um, so what she did there was to, I think, make many rethink what an autobiography is. Is there such a thing as a collective biography? And of course, we have with um, Erdogan's friend, uh, Orhan Pamuk, um, the, the development of this notion of a collective autobiography. So um, I don't want to take up much more time. Um, the only other thing that I wanted to talk about in terms of erased women was her Loin de Medine, or Far from Medina, a very important um, novel study, sort of between the two, where she looks back into deep history, so to the seventh century Arabia, and looks at all those powerful women who were um, either with Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, or against him, and she weaves together this fascinating story. So I'm delighted that um, you have all come to our offering to Asiya Jabbar as we think about this extraordinary woman and the legacy that she has left us. So I'm going to talk today about what is widely considered to be one of Asiya Jabbar's most prominent, but also one of her most difficult texts, her book La Moula Fantasia, or in Dorothy Blair's English transla translation, Fantasia and Algerian Cavalcade. And I will use the English translation to project the citations, although I'll read them in French. The book is the second, as Professor Cook mentioned, in what Jabbar calls her autobiographical quartet. It's not necessarily an autobiography in the strict sense of the word, but she actually intertwines what are presumably her own stories with interviews, ethnographic studies, fictional anecdotes, and historical narratives from the last 150 years of Algeria's history. What is truly significant in her intertwining of history and autobiography, though, is that it explicitly demonstrates her view that Algerian history is very much intertwined with her own lived experiences. But we speak, write, and exchange language every day, usually without thinking twice about these nearly automatic actions. But when we talk about language, we turn to some interesting analogies, some more fitting than others. Language is often described as a medium or a mode of communication 
as a tool, often literary, as a root of identity and identification, even as an economic entity invested with a certain currency. In L'Amour La Fantasia, though, Atia Jabbar reveals language to be a space, temporal, physical, and imagined. When we consider the history of language and language laws in schools, language teaching in schools, in this case in Algeria, we see that such a conceptualization of language is not only fitting, but is also a way that can allow us a better understanding of our own individual language. So I'm going to consider side by side Asya Jabbar's text and the recent history of language education in Algeria, arguing that Jabbar, by treating language as a space, by literatively and figuratively pushing the limits, actually makes the language her own, excluding it from the simple characterization of French, the language of the colonizer. So La Moula Fantasia is composed of intertwining narratives ranging from the day of the French invasion of Algiers in 1830 to the first 20 years following Algerian independence. The voices are those of French soldiers, reporters, and painters during the years of colonization, and of girls and women living during and after the War of Independence. Jabbar appropriates the voices of both colonizer and colonized in a completely unchronological fashion, jumping back and forth between narrative accounts and creating this sort of temporal landscape, or what Bakhtin calls a chronotope, a sort of time-space dimension. And to place this timeline in the context of Jabbar's life, she was born in 1936, which means that she was about 18 at the onset of the war, which lasted from 1954 to 1962. In one of the more assumedly autobiographical vignettes of the book, which is set in Paris in the years following Algeria's independence, the narrator describes a walk she takes with her brother. The moment is interrupted when he interjects an Arabic word, hanuni, approximate in meaning to my dear or my love, and which throws her back to the time of her childhood. Le frère évoque devant moi le dialecte de nos montagnes d'enfance. J'en ressentis un trouble écrelé. J'ai dévié, j'ai rappelé le passé. So first off, I want to draw your attention to the switching between present to the passé composé in the same moment in time. Throughout the text, the Arabic language, as well as Berber, are associated with the past and with tradition. This example, one among many, leads the narrator to intense feelings of nostalgia, regret, and longing, all the more poignant as she is forced to narrate in French. These feelings reflect the history of language laws and language learning in Algeria over the last century. In the final three decades of, Al of Fran France's occupation, French was actually enforced more and more as the primary language, particularly in schools. As a result, generational divides occurred and they were created between grandparents and parents who had learned only Arabic and the younger generation that spoke French fluently and could barely read and write in their mother tongue. The entry of the colonizer's language into Algeria is aptly referred to as an implantation, making language into something very physical. The French initiated this implantation with the idea that in order to unify a region, one had to unify its language. In 1938, actually, Arabic was declared to be une langue étrangère, or a foreign language. In 19, um, as a result, the French language became distinctly associated with citizenship and freedom, especially freedom of movement in a space which no longer belonged to the indigenous population. In many ways, the implantation of French actually had an opposite effect. Different areas of Algeria became more and more defined or delineated by the language of their inhabitants. Algeria's linguistic landscape had never been homogenous, in addition to the languages of Maghrebian origin, namely Berber and Arabic, were those of foreign origin, Spanish, Italian, and Turkish. The policies and attitudes brought to the Maghreb by the French established language as an immense dividing factor among different indigenous groups, as well as, of course, between the native Algerians and the French colonizers. The French even tried to privilege certain groups, for example, the Algerian Jews, in an effort to better control other groups. Different physical language spaces are an ever-present element in La Mour La Fantasia, literally dividing the wor world inhabited by Arabic from that inhabited by French. In a story from Algeria during the years before the outbreak of the war, the narrator describes a French family living in the same Algerian neighborhood, which was home to the school instructors. A young girl at the time, she never enters the family's house 
but along with her friend, she would watch the goings on through the windows. One interaction that specifically captures her attention is between the eldest daughter and her new fiance. Contrary to local customs, the two would publicly display their affection, touching and exchanging words of endearment. So she actually describes her sense of removal and distance as a result of the scenes she watches through the glass. Je décidé que l'amour résidait nécessairement ailleurs. La langue française pouvait tout m'offrir de ces trésors inépuisables, mais pas un. Pas le moindre de ces mots d'amour ne me serait préservé. So essentially, the French language becomes for the narrator a space of intimacy, of the couple, and of a different kind of happiness to which she cannot seem to gain access despite her learning French in school. French is also the language which this same narrator uses to write love letters to an anonymous correspondent overseas. Her words literally travel across the oceanic space. Quand j'écris et lis la langue étrangère, il voyage, il va et vient dans l'espace subversif. On the other hand, she also describes her study of Arabic at the Quranic school in highly spatial terms. Le savoir retourne le doigt au bras, à l'effort physique, effacer la tablette. C'était comme si, après coup, l'on ingérait une portion du texte coranique. This physical space of language is perhaps most apparent in the idea of la langue du, co du corps, or body language. Body language, of course, includes the physical act of l'écrit, writing, but more importantly, it encompasses l'écrit, or cries. Of the female ancestors, both the cries present in the traditional all-female ceremonies led by the matriarch of the family, as well as the cries of despair, mourning, rage that these women exhibited at the time of the invasion of the French and the bloody battles that took place. But lastly, language as an imagined space. A similar sense of disorientation is created in the imagined spaces of the languages, so Arabic and French. Métissage is a significant thread running both through the narratives of l'amour la fantasia and through the overarching historical narrative. Due to the extreme language laws instated during French colonization, establishing French as the official language of Algeria and effectively of, studies, of study and of citizenship, and then directly following independence with the promotion of Arabization, the younger generation who had grown up under French rule were thrown into a state of language ambiguity. So this disorienting and confusing linguistic métissage was felt especially by young writers and commentaries on this specific dialectic between Arabic and French appear very frequently in Jabbar's book. The central female narrator appears to vacillate between the feeling that her linguistic métissage offers her more control and movement in the world and the feeling that one language will forever interrupt the other, leading to what she describes as a mental aphasia. Cette impossibilité en amour, la mémoire de la conquête la renforça. Les mots français commençaient à peine à attaquer ce rempart. J'expérimentais une sorte d'aphasie amoureuse. Les mots écrits, les mots appris, faisaient retrait devant moi. The narrator, and it would appear Jabbar herself, are continually confronted by the limitations of each language and by a feeling of exclusion due to this métissage. We are also reminded in this passage of the very distinct physical spaces, in this case her French school delineated by French, of course. As a result of the aphasic space in which she often finds herself, there's a frustrating sense that she will never be able to fully express herself, and there will always exist silences between her words. The commentaire, anodin ou respectueux, véhiculé par la langue étrangère, traversé une zone neutralisante de silence. Verbe englouti avant toute destination. A final aspect of this imagined space of language and to which Professor Cook alluded earlier is the legitimacy or authenticity that the exchange of language or the communication in language grant. As I mentioned before, during the period of colonization, laws and ordinances related directly to the French language as well as to the enforcement of the superiority of French law made the language into a symbol of freedom, but also of intellect and legitimization of one's citizen status. 
This sense is also conveyed in Jabbar's recounting of the beginning of colonization. So one of the narratives of the fall of Algiers comes from the letter of a French army captain, Joseph Bosquet. Although seemingly of little remorse for the bodies of native women and men brutally murdered during the siege, one of his letters indicates a clear frustration at the lack of regard given to the victorious French soldiers. And this was a frustration, especially at the women who basically refused to raise their eyes to them. L'indigène ne lève pas les yeux pour regarder son vainqueur. Ne le reconnaît pas. Ne le nomme pas. Qu'est-ce qu'une victoire si elle n'est pas nommée? What is a victory if it is not named? This question alone sums up the desire and the need of recognition through naming and thus through language. In this case, by refusing to acknowledge the French soldiers' victory, the women actually refused to grant the victory legitimacy. Despite Jabbar's use for the most part of French words in L'Amour la Fantasia, the language is Jabbar's own. It falls outside the simple character, characterization of French because she constructs it as a space. As the central narrator declares towards the end of the text, je cohabite avec la langue française. Jabbar takes words from the physical spaces of the archives and of the locations where she conducted interviews and ethnographic studies and literally places them on the pages of her book. Sometimes she recounts events in her own words or guesses at things that happened and at words that were said. She also manipulates the narrative flow and syntax of the text. As a consequence, one is literally forced to move back and forth between the pages in order to fully understand the language. And then reading itself thus becomes a very physical or spatial experience. Jabbar's agency is clear in creating the imagined linguistic space of her narratives. She deliberately grants or refuses translation at different points in her text of the transliterated Arabic words that she incorporates. So in one of the final chapters of the book, she directly treats the issue of translation by presenting the word tsarrit from two different Arab French dictionaries. But it is evident from the page and the definitions that are given that neither definition is able to fully capture the meaning and implications of the word, which actually refer to les cris, the cries, of women. So in Jabbar's choice of where to withhold and where to grant translations, she actually straddles the boundary between the oral word, associated with Arabic oral tradition, and the written one, associated with both French writing and French schooling. Moreover, in spite of the limitations and boundaries that each of these languages possess and enforce, and in spite of the aphasic métissage, often experienced, Jabbar is actually able to give voice to Algerian women across generations. And this is actually an accomplishment and a clarity, which although she struggles with it, she herself also recognizes at various moments in the book. Écrire en langue étrangère, hors de l'oralité des deux langues de ma région natale. Écrire m'a ramené à ma seule origine. Écrire ne tue pas la voix, in, her most, in one of her most recent books, Les Voix qui m'assiègent en marche de ma francophonie, which is actually a book that I only recently discovered, Jabbar explores in greater depth the relationship to languages, placing her act of writing in a space hors les langues, outside languages. She tries to explain what, both what writing means to her and also where the ideas of francophonie and francophone voice come into play and also how it all interweaves with her position as an academic, as a woman, an Algerian, a North African. So she asks in one part of the book, sera ce cela écrire? Non, je dirais plutôt transmettre, enseigner, communiquer et chercher sur le terre à sortir des, des limites géographiques de la langue française. Sur ce territoire linguistique de la dite francophonie, Je me place, moi, sur les frontières. So when the writing process begins, language is, of course, a necessary inherent factor, at which point the author must find an effective way to transmit her message. Jabbar actually makes words into her own space in which she both literally and figuratively pushes the geographic limits of the French language, successfully inhabiting its borders, itself a linguistic territory, hors les langues. 
Dorothy Blair, who translated the um, English of this book, in her introduction, remarks that one of the results of Dubar's love-hate relationship with the French language is that at times, quote, in a conscious effort to escape from the shackles of writing in the enemy's language, she seems to be colonizing the language of the colonizers. She does violence to it, forcing it to give up its riches and defying it to hand over its hidden hoard, end quote. So I do not quite agree with Blair's assertion that Jabbar does violence to the French language. However, I do believe that she challenges it, pushes its limits with her extensive use of unusual and foreign vocabulary, her shifts in narrative structure and voice, and her manipulation of grammar and syntax. Rather than considering this a violent act, I would consider it a reconstruction. If she does any violence to the language, it is only to put it back together in a renewed form. One that, and this renewed form is one that bears witness to the presence of languages that are actually other than French and to our identity entre deux and to the heroism of Algeria and its women over the last 150 years. And as Jabbar demonstrates so skillfully in L'Amour, La Fantasia, language is a space that at times can feel isolating, confusing, frustrating, and incredibly limiting. It can also, however, be a space in which the writer reappropriates the limit, effectively inscribing herself into the space and making it her own. In this case, it's really a métissage that ends up being, as Jabbar says, aphasic. So in the case of what I'm trying to talk about today, in terms of language, she first starts experiencing that when she begins learning French at the French school, which is actually where her father teaches. So the neighborhood where she lived, that was also where the French family lived. So it's sort of at that moment that she begins to sort of experience this huge ambiguity. She feels, on the one hand, excluded from the French culture. She writes these love letters that she sort of feels that she cannot express her full love in the other language, that love will always be sort of distant from her, and then begins to feel excluded from you know, the, the space of Arabic as well. She actually talks about at one point in her book how she was forced to stop going to the chronic school once she hit puberty. So um, again, sort of this exclusion from both worlds, and it ends up with sort of this mixing, métissage, of the two languages. But for her, what she, sort of, what she discusses in this book sort of throughout a running thread, is that this métissage is also an aphasia. And I, I would argue that at the end of the book, and actually even more in Les Voix qui m'assiègent en marche de ma francophonie, she actually realizes, you know, the, the I guess I would say, the, the good that comes out of writing, even though it is French, she is able to bring this métissage into her own writing. And I think that she does start to recognize that it's really something that she grapples with throughout the text, you know, she's constantly asking, like, how can I be writing, not in my own mother tongue, I'm writing in French, and I'm writing about subjects where I should be writing in Arabic. And she really does successfully um, incorporate Arabic words. And as I said, sometimes she translates, sometimes she gives a whole page of what the word means, and sometimes she doesn't say it all. And actually, Dorothy Blair offers this great glossary at the very beginning of the book with five pages of the Arabic words that appear, the ones that she doesn't translate. So but that does not appear in the French version. I, I was wondering how your you know you might think about silence in, in in Fantasia in relation to your the spatial sort of theoretical frame. I, you yeah. see what I mean? Just yes. because she she there's so much that she's doing that's about silence, especially uh, in the archive, the, the archive she has to, to turn to. So. Yeah, I think that even on the borders, there's always going to be these limits. Even the borders have borders. So there will always be things left unsaid, either because, you know, we don't have the, and she spent a long time in the archives, but either we don't have those narratives, so that we don't have actual access to them, or because things are impossible to translate across languages. So I, you know, it was just, trying to think about how Dorothy Blair must have like, grappled with uh, even trying to translate some of these things from French because we don't either have the same sort of syntactical nuances in English or the translations for the words and then even more so from Arabic. Um, could you go back two slides? Uh, I thought that the translation 
um, of this particular past passage was, oh, um, maybe not that one. Oh, uh, this one? No, um, the one which talks about verbe en l'outil avant toute destination. Yeah. I thought the, the translation was really peculiar. I thought it was really uh, peculiar. And, and that the English translation had, it registers space differently than the French does. Yeah. Because avant toute destination isn't really to reach its destination. For me, it's, it implies that it's before the, the possibility right. of there right. even being a destination. So I was wondering if you could talk about kind of this, this interesting slippage here and what's kind of going on there, what, 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 what the translator is trying to do and what Jabal is trying to, to do. Yeah, so I think it's, this is something really interesting and I actually wondered if some of these phrases and terms were better left in the French within the English version because as I said, like, you know, in zone neutralisante and a lot of the other terms that are sort of used are very, very French and they aren't really translatable into English. It's sort of this question of, you know, is it better for the, for the reader who does not speak French at all to sort of have this quasi translation that doesn't actually encompass the full meaning of the French or to have leave the French and then maybe if they have some French background will understand the meaning or will try to look it up in a dictionary themselves. Um, I guess I personally would have left a lot of the phrases and this wasn't the only one that I was sort of questioning but that perhaps the French should have been left. But I, I think it had to have been an interesting process because there's even a part of the book where they talk about um, pronouns that are used uh, both in Arabic and then, you know, that's sort of translated into French. But, it, I, you know, it's a passage you have to reread and reread. But in English, we don't even have the same sort of grammatical concepts and tactical um, nuances. So, you know, again, some of these passages were, I mean, arguably impossible to translate in sort of the complete sense in which they appeared in the original. You seem to take issue with the fact that someone said that she uh, brutalizes, uh, she does violence to the language. Uh, I would like to hear you say more, a little more about that. Yeah, so, you know, I think that doing violence to French, you know, violence is, the idea is very, very negative, and she doesn't, she doesn't, I feel like, in the case of her, it's really more of an incorporation. It's not sort of this cutting down of the different languages, but a meet, if you will, a métissage of them. So, you know, this use of Arabic within, embedded within the French. Um, so I don't think that she, you know, I think that what we end up with is Jabbar's sort of own language. It's not this sort of somehow um, partially destroyed French. You know, I really would characterize this. I, I don't think I could characterize this as, French. Um, even, you know, I had someone look at some of the these citations the other day who is from Paris and said, I don't even understand like what this, I like really had to look at the syntax, which is so, it's, you know, not even something that's necessarily used normally in French um, to sort of figure out what was happening. So I don't think that she, I wouldn't say that she does violence. I feel like that's a very, very strong wording. I, I do feel like it's this, um, you know, reappropriation of her identities and of the languages that she that she speaks and that you know form a part of her of her ancestors of her family um, to sort of come with this reconstructed. She reconstructs her own space, doesn't tear down another. I wonder if one can actually make um, a comparison in terms of violence to the French language with Vermont. You no, know, so the language of the the French ghetto, where the words are torn apart, reversed. I mean, I think that would be violence, right? Because then, then you are kind of left with a kind of cadaverous language. So I'd like to bring another woman writer into our discussion of Asiya Jabbar today, Hali the Edip. It's, um, uh, she, uh, she is an uh, Ottoman Turkish uh, woman who established herself uh, as a modern writer. Uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, and you may wonder, and um, what does um, Jabbar has to do with her, uh, given the you know, time difference and, um, and geographical difference. 
Um, but my intention by bringing them together uh, today as a comparative case uh, is to point out a larger context, uh, which I believe they uh, belong to. Uh, and I believe this context is a centuries-old literary tradition which can be traced in the works of Middle Eastern women writers, specifically the ones from margins. And therefore, today I'd like to focus on their way of writing, uh, which is formed uh, both as resistance and a claim of existence um, within a context where they are marginal, but also accepted. For instance, I don't think uh, it's a coincidence that Jabbar and Edeb are strikingly similar in terms of their personal and educational background, and more important, uh, in terms of their writing styles. In other words, um, even though they are from different time and place, uh, there are two major examples of the same Middle Eastern literary and intellectual history. And um, being a Middle Eastern woman writers of the 20th century, Jabbar and Edip were supposed to be silent uh, on the, you know, based on the classical postcolonial theories, which focus on the impossibility of the speaking subject on the grounds that the discourse controls what is and can be said. And interestingly, uh, feminist postcolonial studies, um, and, and, and I'm going to refer to the Turkish ones, uh, for instance, Yenolu or Kandioti, uh, also confirm this doomed positioning of the other as eternally suppressed and enslaved. And moreover, they added uh, national patriarchies as another means of oppression. They argue that between imperialism and colonialism, third world women in general and Ottoman women in particular were turned into double prisoners of tradition and modernization. I believe what uh, feminist postcolonial theories are missing is what women uh, such as Jabbar and uh, Edip are first and foremost, are writers. Uh, so they should be considered in a historical literary context. And, and a lack of such inquiry leaves any consideration to remain within the confines of the dominant colonial discourses and adds on to the predominantly ahistorical considerations of the main tenets of Islamic religion and their implications for women. When we take a look at Jabbar and Edib's writing, uh, we see a consistent use of certain narrative techniques uh, such as fragmentation, use of multiple voices, nonlinear plots, uh, lines, and last but not least, alternative uses of language. Everything about Jabbar and Edib's writing seems to breaking rules and, for instance, deconstructing the binaries, uh, which are the building blocks of colonial discourse, such as the self and other, private and public, mind and body. Uh, and these are not oppositions, but extensions of each other in a fluid process in their writing. Uh, in this frame, no wonder Jabbar opens uh, her fantasia uh, with the title, The Capture of the City, or Love Letters. She interchangeably uses war and love, uh, not as opp oppositions, but as metaphors of similar desire to make history, major or personal. The way they break these binary, uh, binaries and binary thinking as to, um, making them only meaningful in context to each other is with the help of a common narrative technique in Islamic literatures, which can be called mirroring or ring composition. This is done in, uh, in various ways in the literary history, such as corresponding two uh, well-balanced and complementary couplets to complicate the meaning in classical poetry, or using tropes like dreams to represent an alternate, or better yet, supra-reality. Both Jabbar and Edib not only make use of this classical narrative technique, but also transform their writing into a side of resistance which cannot be categorized. An, explan an explanation of this narrative technique may be found in the fusion between two different uh, but kindred ways of seeing the world. The Quranic vision of creation on the one hand, and the cosmology of Neoplatonism on the other. What they have in common is the notion that all manifestations of material reality within them uh, carry within themselves the imprint of the heavenly power which brought them into existence. Thus, according to the Quran, every created object is a sign, an ayah, 
or ayat, pointing to the creator. Human beings' task consists in using their mental fa faculties in order to comprehend the message these signs convey, for their meaning is elusive. In Neoplatonism, uh, the transcendental signification of material objects is asserted as well. However, here it derives from their being part of a, of a hierarchy of mirroring and uh, analogies, uh, which stretches in an unbroken chain from the lowliest of creatures to the angelic spheres, and ultimately to the one who is the source of all. So today, I'd like to uh, give you two specific examples uh, from Jabbar and Edip, illustrating their ways of using mirroring or the ring uh, composition as a resistance or negotiating an existence in the literary world or global and local milieus. In the first section, um, I'll try to show how they use it to construct their fragmented plot line to tell an alternative history. And in the second section, I will discuss their use of second languages uh, as the metaphor of silence to resist their local patriarchal traditions. Among their works, um, I find their autobiographical, uh, autobiographical writing uh, relate uh, relative to my uh, discussion today. So therefore, I will try to show what uh, Jabbar's Fantasia and Edib's memoirs are two texts speaking to each other in terms of a de definition of a genuine writing style, uh, specifically for the women in the Middle East. Let's look at memoirs. Um, it was um, written in English in uh, 1926, and it's, uh, it consists of two uh, parts. In the first part, um, it tells the uh, childhood of Khalid Edib, and the second part is the uh, history of uh, modern Turkey. And, um, and I see uh, parallels in these two parts. Like Jabbar, Edib is consciously addressing the issue of the authoritative voice uh, by either referring to herself in the third person or incorporating other people's voices in her life story. Her self-representation consists of not only her memories, but also other people's stories. The intertwined stories of her cells, including the blurry memory of childhood, child, childhood, are necessary parts of her identity. Edip writes her personal history along with the major history as their reflection. On the other side, she's not interested in making a hero of herself, though. For instance, she mentions she read the major works of Islamic history uh, as a child. Coming from a Mevlevi family, she is particularly sympathetic to the story of Ali. She says, I quote, from the material and political point of view, Ali is the least successful hero. Every adversary of his takes advantage of his nobility of heart. He finally dies unsuccessful, but undoubted, always morally clean, manly and humane to his enemies. No wonder there are so many religious sects that worship him, not only as a he great hero, but even as the incarnation of Allah." Edith refers to the secret knowledge of the Alevite communities in Anatolia. Um, but immediately after this section, um, uh, she brings up another hero, Mustafa Kemal, the leader of the Turkish Nationalist Project, where she says, I quote, during our own early Republican struggles at Angora, Mustafa Kemal Pasha was studying the epoch-making struggle, struggles of the Islamic Republic. I was interested to observe his contempt uh, for what he considered Ali's weakness. Ali was a fool, he used to say, I unquote. Now, as opposed to Mustafa Kemal's nutuk, or the speech, which is his treatise of the Republican history, and considered semi-sacred up until today in Turkey, Edip offers an alternative history, which is not interested in heroes, but in the people who make it. Um, Jabbar is deliberately, is also very deliberate in, the, in her way of using uh, history. This is the first two sections uh, of the book, and um, you see the you know the and one chapter is titled with words, and the following chapter is titled with numbers. Um, they follow each other like this. The numerical chapters um, uh, 
or the, you know, the verbal chapters is talking about herself and the numerical chapters is the chronicles that she is retelling. Um, retelling of the, you know, 150 years of occupation of Algeria. Now these, um, and then she's reconstructing stories uh, in these chapters. And, and these reconstructive stories of chronicles are carefully selected to tell the untold version of the historical incidents. She carefully chooses the ones ignored by ma major history and give them their voices, including the French officers who attempted to give an honest account of what really happened. Jabbar pays her tribute to those Arab, Berber, and French people who suffered throughout the process and thankful to those who kept the record, either through writing or memory, uh, so that she could understand the past now. The juxtaposition of the stories of individuals bridge what public events, wars, political and or politics left behind. They tell the history uh, from the margins, daily life struggles of wars, and more importantly, the, the gendered experience of war. Jabbar tells the uh, suffering of women and their active participation in wars uh, or political struggles, sometimes through romantic love stories and other times through violent images such as Arab women mutilating their enemies. What is common among these people is that they were all forgotten. By telling the untold uh, experiences of war, either through the suffering chronicles or listening to women, in the third section, that she is also retelling the um, stories she hears, um, she heard from the uh, from women. Um, and I would like to give you the second example now, like other than the structure um, and the way they use the second language, and as uh, as veiling. I, and, and then I think, you know, she calls that as veiling themselves from their, you know, patriarchal traditions. Uh, just like they built their plot structure, they create a ring composition between the original and the target language. Uh, like Fantasia, memoirs were written in the second language uh, of the author. Um, Edip wrote it in English, which she learned at an early age while being educated at the American Missionary School in Istanbul. And like Jabbar, she was silent, uh, or she was sent to the, to the school by her father who believed in Western education. The first chapter of Edip's story is devoted to a child who could cross both physical and linguistic boundaries. As she can go either male and female sections of the house, she travels between languages. She says, quote, the little girl didn't recognize that she spoke two languages, one at school, one at home. Symbolically, writing her memoirs in English while she was on exile in Europe or in the US allows her to go between geograph geographical and linguistic spaces. One of her intentions for writing her memoirs in English is her, her self-defense. After being accused as a traitor in Kemal's, uh, Mustafa Kemal's magnum opus, Nutuk, or speech, she was compelled to leave the country only to come back after his passing. Although Edip uh, took active roles in the nationalism process, her disagreements with the nation's father put her reputation in danger. So she writes not only to save herself, but also the major history of modern Turkey. And she chooses to write in English first, and then years later, in 1960s, she, transla she translates them into Turkish. This is nothing but translating or transcribing her work into the original. And Jabbar's story uh, also opens with the scene where a little Arab girl goes to school walking hand in hand with her father. It is when she receives a love letter from a boy, a classmate, that she realizes the significance of language. First, it was written in French, and second, it was destroyed by her father. Through this incident, she discovers a secret. Love is a trespassing, trespassing action and its vehicle is the second language. That is when her awakening takes place, she loses her innocence and becomes the telling or the writing subject of her life story. She says, I quote, in these early stages of my sentimental education, our secret correspondence is carried on French. That's the language that my father had been at pains for me to learn. 
serves as a go-between. And from now on, uh, from now, a double contradictory sign over my initiation. Unquote. Like Edip's resistance to the role of the daughter of Republic, Jebar resists her father by the equivalent acts of love or writing, and they both do that through the second language. Jabbar addresses the issue of writing in French in several instances throughout the novel, and she admits that French is her stepmother's tongue, which allows her to travel between texts, such as between French, Arabic, or Berber, or written and oral. She explains her reasons for using French clearly. I quote, autobiography, practice in the enemy's language, has, to, has the texture of fiction. While I thought I was undertaking a journey through myself, I find I'm simply choosing another veil. While I intended every step forward to make me more clearly identifiable, I find myself progressively sucked, up, sucked down into the anonymity of those women old ancestors. Jabbar and Edith were aware of the trespassing uh, impact of writing. And, and the given conditions such as wars or adver adversaries are only one part of the story. The act of writing in symbolic terms, a process of inner and eventually outer growth. It reflects the emancipation of consciousness from an attachment to the transient physical world to the acquisition of personal, which ensure both personal and collective survival. Thank you. I found a very interesting comparison, and I, I don't know if I'll the deep well enough to really uh, comment at length, except I was curious about the fact that uh, in the way you presented it, <clears throat> she has two languages, but not three. And I think what's really fascinating to me, I've talked You mean it, you know, Jabbar has three languages. She has, oh, yes. she has four. Or four languages. Mm -hmm. I mean, multiple languages, but not more. So I, I've taught this book for almost 20 years, so I, I know it much better than I can ever say about it. But what's always curious to me is about the oral language. And, I wonder how, in your analysis, you deal with the register of the oral language as opposed to the two written languages, or the fourth one. Right. I think, you know, I should make this more clear, um, especially for Edith's case as well. She is also, you know, talking about multiple languages, like including Greek and Armenian, spoken mm -hmm. in Istanbul while she was growing up, you know. And again, like and at some point, she's talking about, you know, how... She doesn't know the difference between Greek and Turkish. But the sense of like, you know, uh, what language she should speak, it happens with the awakening. You know, she grows up and, and she realizes that, you know, she needs to speak uh, only two languages now, English and Turkish. And she's like, you know, and she's pretty honest about it, like writing about this and, you know, saying that, you know, I forgot my Greek. And, and so, and, and I, I guess they are also compared. Well, I guess, like, you know, I was very, you know, um, I was using my time uh, in, in carefully here not to go in detail that, you know, many languages they go through. I think they're very similar in that way, too. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe the, if I can interject, the alternative is uh, Khatibi's relationship also with these two languages, which ended in Amor Bilang. Both, which is at the same time double critique. Um, I mean, you can use them, but at the same time, deconstruct and, and criticize both at the same time, very mm -hmm. critical stance. Exactly. I wonder if he actually knew more Arabic, though. I mean, we know that he knew much more Arabic than, than Jabbar did. And I think they're picking up on what you were saying. I'm thinking there's a question of anxiety. Um, because with Khatibi, he keeps talking about the, the Arabic that keeps trying to burst through his French, and he's so, he keeps on trying, like maybe, trying to control it and uh, to, to hold on to the control of the French. So I wonder if there's, what you think about whether there's a question of that kind of anxiety with Holiday indeed. Um, is she afraid that her Turkish is going to come through, or does she want the Turkish to come through, or is she so entirely um, at one with the English? That's a good question. I, I never, I, I never occurred to me, but it's a point that I need to consider. It looks like it's, um, and I, 
so far I felt like she was very coherent and you know it flows uh, in English and it's um, um, and she doesn't feel sorry that she's like in English yeah. you know um, and I, I feel like you know she doesn't have a choice at that moment and um, but I have to look at it in, again from this perspective yeah I've chosen today to say something about the film that Asya Jeba made with Malak Alula, um, at least partly with Malak Alula, La Zada et Les Chants de l'Oubli, um, which was released around 1981. There are a few different variations on that date that are, um, are provided. Um, but it was a film that was made for Radio Television Algerienne. I chose this piece for a few reasons. Um, the first is personal. Um, the second is, um, is because I've become very interested in questions around uh, um, the visual arts that cite earlier technologies um, in, in post-colonial, broadly post-colonial um, art, by which I mean various artists from the 70s to, to today. Between 1993 and around 1997, I met Asya Jeba a few times in Paris, mostly in cafes in the 11th arrondissement, where I informally asked her questions about her work, about Algeria, and about things she had worked on. Her interest in various media was fascinating to me, on painting, most famously in Les Femmes d'Alger dans leur appartement, but also in her essays on the painter Baya Mahyadine, um, in her interest in urban space, in confinement, in music, in the technology of the radio, the archival image, in the plural languages, pure and impure, that she referred to in many of her works. And of course, we've been discussing that. At the time, it was quite difficult to get a hold of her films. Um, uh, one could pick up some of the classics of Algerian cinema um, in videos at, um, in, on VHS at the flea markets in Paris, um, pirated versions, but also through Tassili Video, which um, distributed many films. But there was a lot of material that was unavailable. She had in those days an office at the old Centre Culturel Algerien in Paris, which in those days was a bit of a dump. It's, it's a beautiful building now. Um, uh, it, bear, it bore no resemblance to the impressive structure that there is today. But it was, um, yeah, it was a, it was a pretty rundown building. There, she introduced me to a Monsieur Bouchouchi, who was in charge of the films. And for the next couple of weeks, um, sometime during that period, I watched many of them seated on a rather uncomfortable chair in a rather messy archive. When it came to watching La Zerda ou Les Chants de l'Oubli. Um, everyone, because I had actually met some other people by that time who were joining me on these uncomfortable chairs, was horrified to see that in the middle of the film, which is about the archive, the nature of the archive, technologies of the archive, and particularly technologies of the colonial archive, there was a big problem, not an uncommon one in the age of VHS. Someone had recorded something else in the middle. <laughs> an apparently trivial conversation between men had arbitrarily become part of this film on the archive. Now, Monsieur Bouchouchi sheepishly, sheepishly went over to Asya Deva's office to explain the problem, and it was obviously a crisis moment. She had told him that this was the sole copy available to her, that given the civil war in Algeria, she did not know whether a copy would exist in the archives of the RTA, of the Radio Television Algeria, for which the film had been made. All this was going on for me off camera, as it were, as I stood around the corner. But something remains distinct for me about what Bat might call the grain of her voice. The grain of her voice that... Um, that, that in Ces Voix qui m'assiègent, she describes in terms of 
uh, the guttural Arabic that she has, that she inscribes in French, both in her writing, but is also there in her voice. Because of course, the question of voice, the tenor of voice, not only what a voice might say or what a voice might represent, as it were, was very important to her. Now, a few hours later, she lent me another copy, her personal copy. Obviously, this hadn't been the only one. Probably the last one, she said, as she entrusted it to me. Um, no doubt something she had also said to Monsieur Bouchouchi. I watched it and returned it. Now, of course, the film is easily available on the web. Um, I have not seen the trivial conversation between men appear again. The different technologies of the archive today have cleaned up the film a little bit. Now, I bring this up not to claim any special privileged insight because of these encounters with the presence of Asya Jibba. My connection to her was, um, you know, um, actually, you know, it wasn't a major connection. I met her those few times in Paris over a few years and a couple of intense weeks in Ithaca, New York in 1998, I think. I remember her stance when she answered questions about that other period piece from a certain feminism of the 1970s, La Nouba des Femmes de Mont Chenois. But honestly, more than her presence, her work has stayed with me. So I really want to thank the organizers for asking me to do this. It's given me the opportunity to go back to looking at her work, which I haven't done for, you know, since I, since I wrote Al Algeria Cuts and, um, uh, in any great detail. Um, and um, I've really enjoyed going back to it in the context now of thinking about visual artists who cite earlier technologies, as I was saying. Now, Jeba describes her films as image son, as using image son, images, sounds, often in the context of asking why she moved from writing to film, because at, a, at the moment it seemed as if this was going to be a transition for her. Of course, it was never a permanent move, but nonetheless, there are distinct differences she cites. She's able to work with the colloquial Arabic a little bit more in the context of finding herself inadequate to the tasks of writing in Arabic, that she could work for television in the context of a large population of women television viewers who may not have access to the literature um, to explore the multiple media already of interest in her writing multiple media of things like radio that come up in her, um, in her other writing. At the very least, the films are not only image sans, they are certainly invested in text alongside the question of oral transmission and song, so specifically song, which is its own version of song. Jeba writes something about this in the collection of essays, uh, Ses Voix and it is certainly the case that her sense of the literary and of the filmic are not ever confined to any one genre, as we've been talking about. Her plays bleed into her novels, her films are infiltrated by the still image, her poems are not only read or sung, but written, and also constitute critical essays, and her films are, one could say, contemplations on the signifier in various form image, sound, metonymy, montage, and a quite resistant to narration, particularly La Zada. La Zada ou les chants de l'oubli, or the songs, la, the Zada or the songs of forgetting, her second film is a film of and about the archive, about memory, genre, the image, and sound rendered as song in the title, the songs of forgetting. The only consistency in the film is its lack of what Michel Chillon called syncresis. There is rarely relation between image and sound, only a sense of the disjuncture, the contrapuntal, what Clarisse Zimraz noted in relation to Deleuze as the op signs and sans signs, such that the disjunctive nature of the filming creates a contemplation of time and its technology, rather than collapsing into a realist rendition, creative and narrative, out of archives. The film was made by Asya Jeba alongside Malika Lula, um, 
definitely um, Jebar taking the lead. Um, when they were married, they had been told that Pate Gourmand was going to throw away much of its colonial archive material. And this was the occasion for two, now, you know, one of them, of course, more well-known than the other, um, two products, Malaka Lula's well-known homage to Algeria and to Roland Barthes, um, Le Haram Colonial, the colonial harem, and um, Jeba and Alula's La Zada ou les Champs de l'Oubli. If the colonial harem is haunted by a contemplation of photography as a kind of spirit medium that we see in Camera Lucida and A Lover's Discourse from Bart, with an epistolary response from nowhere, as it were, in La Zada we begin with a contemplation too of the technology of the screen. Photography and film work with different versions of ideality, the former with a prolonged gaze, the latter with the cut. Both forms may raise the question of whether photography and film record or constitute another, as Benjamin might put it through Edgar Allan Poe, photography provides the traces left by man. I just want to show you the first couple of minutes. الذاكرة جسد امرأة الذاكرة جسد امرأة ملثمة عينها الطليقة وحدها تركز حاضرنا كل ما مضى مات والماضي يبقى من أفراح أجدادنا وبعد موتهم تبقى هذه الصورة you see here, of course, is the citation of the process of archivization within the archive itself, right? The insistence of turning to the instrument of archivization, um, that is the, um, the camera, right? Um, in the context of the technologies of the visual in coloniality, one can think of numerous artists from the 1970s who, like Jeba, have worked with the colonial archives, not only to denounce them, but also to show that the desires and ideations we live with are products of the technologies of coloniality, such that an op oppositional relation is really not possible, that writing back is not going to work and is not really the issue at hand. These constitute what I would call the art of the technologies of unbelonging. One could think of Isaac Julian citing Marc Allegret's camera who made films in Africa as he traveled with his lover André Gide, or Zineb Sedira who looks to the archives of Algerian lighthouses to understand the technologies of borders and writing. Or Walid Rad, and the, um, and the creation of uh, false archives of those who died in the war in Lebanon, or indeed the problem of the ideation of belonging played out in Mona Hatoum's use of the epistolary in video art to show the letter that may not arrive, to reference a conversation we were having earlier. Asya Jeba's film, like many, of the post-colonial artistic endeavors that make use of the archive does so less to tell a different story, to correct a narrative, or to assert a belonging where that was once impossible. There isn't any sense of replacing the inauthentic with the authentic. Rather, the technologies that produce and consolidate ideations of belonging are themselves placed in view for analysis. When we look to the manner in which technology, the apparatus itself is foregrounded in many of those kinds of works that I've cited, um, in many of these works of the archive, archive fever is less about the problem of representations in the archive 
and more about the insanity of collection such that belonging and unbelonging both become problems. Unbelonging then isn't then countered by, by, um, by, a, by, a becoming, by, by becoming a figure of belonging. As such, the songs of forgetting are marked by the grains of voice available only through recording, the technology of recording, its breakdown, its technology of memories and aphasia, the problem of voice, perhaps, more than the claiming of one. And I'll stop there. I was really fascinated with the first frame you showed of the veiled women, and then you mentioned the fact that the veiled women. And veiled comes up a lot also in Fantasia, but it seems to me a different way, and I wonder if you can kind of talk me through it, because this film is done in 82, Fantasia comes out in 85, in French, of course, later translated English. So they're almost, not at the same time, but almost overlapping in terms of this period in her life. And my sense of it in Fantasia is that she's doing more what the TV calls a double critique. She's looking at how people in Algeria take the veil to be something which authorizes women in public, but the one veil that they won't refuse to uplift is the veiled voice. But the woman who cries, the woman who speaks, it's much more dangerous to the woman who is, as it were, veiled but not seen. So is, is that kind of ambiguity about veiling also in this movie, or is she moving from film back to literature to do something that she can't do in film? Well, you know, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that it does have the same ambiguity, because I think that voice, um, functions differently here. I mean, I, I, which of course is to do with the medium, right? Um, uh, that voice is there in these songs, that the, com uh, the poems composed by a Moroccan writer, sung by um, a Japanese singer, um, you know, the kind of, I mean, I bring that up because it's exactly the kind of mixing that she's very interested in, in, um, Les femmes d'Alger dans leur appartement, where she, you know, talks about these kinds of this kind of um, uh, mixing that you see in um, uh, that that that's the that's the stuff of radio, right? I mean, because the, you have this the, the figure, the 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 maternal figure who is anything but pure, in fact, is working with the impurity of language, right, um, in the radio station, and so I think um, that here. Um, Voice is actually not associated with um, with with image, right? Um, it is about actually more about a disjuncture of voice and image, um, such that um, uh, su such that 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 the the voice. Um, I mean to to think back through the later essays of C'est moi qui m'assiège, the voices that besiege me, I suppose, or seize me, I prefer to think of, um, uh, um, uh, are, um, are problems that are um, not so much an inability to articulate a political position, but are the, um, the, um, the material of the problem. Right, the the, the the constitute the material of the problem. And so I think that that veil and voice actually function differently in um, in film than they do in the writing. When you talk about the disjuncture between uh, the voice and the image, I guess since I haven't seen, I haven't actually seen this, um, but I'm wondering if it's more disjuncture between voice and meaning, because. I, I see the, the voice and the image working together, even if it's to alienate us. But it seems to me that it's fighting against me. Um, well, I think that there is, um, there is certainly an attention that is drawing, drawn to voice as, uh, as sound. Right, as, 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 as um, a, a, the tenor of the voice um, uh, that, is, um, that is distinct from what is actually said. But I also think that um, as you move through the film with these, it has four sections 
Um, and I, I mean, I have wondered whether actually these four sections are coherent or not, or, or somewhat arbitrary. Um, but um, but I, I don't really see the issue so much as being meaning, as being, um, uh, no, I, I don't really see meaning as being being at the core here. I mean, I think that, that you know, in that first, um, uh, the French that uh, the the voice first of all with the French words um, that come on the screen. I mean, I think there it it would seem as if there is going to be the articulation of something that is um, a replacement of one image with another, and there isn't. There isn't that. You know, there isn't a correction that takes place, and so. That's partly why I think that there is this kind of out of sequence. Mm -hmm. Deborah, I loved your, your Let description. Let me just quickly of, introduce uh, Deborah Jensen, who is the director of the Franklin Humanities Institute that has so kindly hosted us. And, uh, and I was teaching, otherwise I would have been here from, from the, the very start, because this looks like an absolutely fascinating event. So I loved your description of the, the triangular aperture of in, in the veil. And I was thinking about just the, the paradigm of the cinematographic apparatus and the way that one could, could look at um, eyes and openings and fabric as a different kind of, of apparatus um, that is both subject and object um, uh, accessible. And I just wondered if you could say a, a little bit more about uh, cognition and vision and um, if, if you could just riff a little bit more on this fascinating issue. Right, right. Well, I mean, she, she brings it up herself, and she talks about it herself, um, this, this triangular aperture, as it were, um, uh, that, that, that shapes a certain vision of the world, and that is, that, that is uh, um, I mean, maybe this actually speaks to, to, to Bruce's point as well, um, uh, that, um, that, 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 that is another way of seeing. She doesn't expand on it that much, um, but it seems it seems to me that um, that that what she's uh, what she's foregrounding there is also the the figure of woman as in in uh, um, as um, as if you like the um, the the instrument of the technology of perception, um, and um, and yes, the screen herself, you know, whatever the most uh, consumable and the you know most uh, consumed um, uh, and the biggest consumer, one could say, right, in the context of uh, well, so many things, but um, but certainly of, of the, her uh, Jebba's idea of her television view. Um, but I think, um, but I think uh, also, you know, it, it, it goes to this question of um, of perception. Since you bring up perception, this question of perception as bound by memory and aphasia, right? That um, it, it, it's to me, it, it speaks to the question of um, of um, of the archive, the colonial archive, and the way that she's talking about it, maybe it's true of all archives, um, as, um, uh, as uh, elaborating on the question of, um, of uh, the anxiety around absence, um, and that memory and uh, aphasia are all part of these, that there is no presence to actually be absorbed, confronted, to live with, there is only this memory and aphasia, which is to be, which is the, which is the thing that we can encounter. Thank you. Thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.